Our next guest is a serial entrepreneur with the ultimate rags to rich life story. Being forced to flee Iran as a child with his family to survive, he ended up spending part of his childhood in a refugee camp in Germany. After eventually making it to the USA and serving his new country with the 101st Airborne Division of the US Army, he continued to advance building an empire that gives so much to so many. Today, he is the CEO of PHP Agency Incorporated, a financial services agency with over 12,000 agents in both the US and Puerto Rico. For many of us around the world, we know him as the leader and presenter of the YouTube channel Valuetainment that has nearly 3 million subscribers and growing fast. Beyond sharing his business, financial, social commentary, and entrepreneurial insights, he also interviews the widest variety and most interesting guests of any channel I have ever seen. From infamous figures such as Kobe Bryant, Jordan Peterson, Peter Schiff, Robert Kiyosaki, and Ben Shapiro, to former military generals, snipers, undercover FBI agents, reformed high-ranking criminals, and even a North Korean defector, he never ceases to deliver the most intriguing commentary and insight on nearly every topic. Father, husband, veteran, millionaire, teacher, leader, entrepreneur, and all-round top bloke, he is Patrick Bet David. Pat, I am absolutely honored to meet you. Thanks for coming to the channel. Great intro. It's great to be with you. Pat, I acknowledge that you got into, I guess, your riches from the insurance industry. But I think most people around the world is fair to say that we know you from your work on valuetainment. Now, I know that you're not very big on too many compliments, but I also understand that you're big on values. And one of my values is to really give respect where respect is due. And I'd like to start off by saying thank you for what you do for all of us. Thank you for what you teach us. And thank you for giving it to us for free. Anytime. And it's so funny. You said, I don't like compliments, but I'll take that one. Thank you. Thank you. Look, I want to share a quick story with you, an icebreaker, if I may. Last year, I was in a desert. I won't say too much, but I was in the Middle East in a gym working out at one o'clock in the morning. I think you can probably figure out what the background to that is. I want to talk about your most memorable interview for me, and I want to see if you can guess which one it is. Now, it wasn't the most informative, but it was the most interesting. So I'm in a gym. It's one o'clock in the morning. I'm lifting. I'm in the middle of my session, and I had to stop to actually look at my phone, to actually see what was happening in your interview was real. It got heated. It started in one direction. It started to go down another direction. And I had to replay this thing. It blew my mind. I'm glad that you published it. It went from good to bad to worse, but you stood your ground and you held your values. Do you know what conversation I'm talking about? Lucian Truscott. Oh, yeah, of course. That was the one. Brother. <laughs> Mate, as I said, it wasn't the most informative, but certainly the most memorable. <laughs> can you tell me a little bit about that in the sense that I can see that whenever you interview someone, you do the right thing by looking in their background. You afford them a chance to give their values and their opinion. But what went wrong with that interview? You know, it's funny when we were speaking offline, uh, typically I'll go a couple minutes to establish some kind of a relationship with the viewer and I'll, you know, with the, with the person I'm interviewing, do you know what we stand for? Do you know the audience? Do you know what we are? All this stuff. Great. So we got started and right off the bat within three minutes, he was triggered. I never said to tear down the statue. I said to, I said, okay, let's just say you said to remove it. And then every time we were going it almost seemed like he was getting more and more upset. And uh, by the 10th minute, I think he was telling himself, I should have never said yes to this interview because he didn't do his proper due diligence on the interview, knowing the fact that we interview a lot of interesting people. And we're not one of those channels that says, tell us the key to success. You know, like even yourself, look at the question you just started off with. You just started off with a great question. No one's ever starting an interview with the question you just asked right now, right? You asked the question, and you make it interesting for me. But for him, he typically only did interviews with people that agreed with his position. He never did any interviews with people that didn't agree with his position. And I, no matter whether I agree with you or not, I'm still going to ask questions as if I disagree with you. And sometimes I agree with you, but that's not the interviewee sometimes doesn't know that I do it because it's the one way to get the audience to make a decision for themselves by hearing some of the opposing arguments. So Within the first three minutes, we knew it was going to be an interesting interview. Well, what I certainly got out of it wasn't so much the content that he gave, but how you taught us how to handle that situation and to hold your ground, maintain your values. And, and really, in the end, just as you described, you do what you do. They're the guest in your house. I am curious, though, did he ask you to take it down? Did he ask you not to publish no, that video? No, nothing. And by the way, there was a lot worse stuff that we didn't publish it. I mean, 
at the end, when you saw him say what he said, it went for another 10 minutes like that. We just oh, wow. cut it. He would not stop. But then I said, if we show more than that, it's going to be a humiliating situation. I wasn't going to do that. He went into some very bad places that would have hurt his character. I just said, I'm just going to leave the last part and we're not the rest of the five, 10 minutes. Well, it certainly interrupted my workout session, but I had to stop <laughs> what I was doing. I had to put my phone on the dumbbell rack and change what I was doing so I could actually see it. And, and I normally listen in two times speed, but because it was just so intriguing, I actually watched it in real time speed. But look, moving on, be, before we get to some very serious global issues, I wanted to point out one of your videos in particular, Plot Your Next 15 Moves was awesome. So to my subscribers, if you haven't seen Patrick's work, you must watch some of the stuff that he gives us. In, in many ways, you're my mentor. In many ways, you have taught me a lot of things that I thought I should have known, stuff that I should have learned in university and in my, in my degrees and my master's. You're giving me a lot, and I want to talk about university in a second, but one point in particular, point 0.4.5 point in Plot Your Next 15 Moves was about having enemies. Now, do you think the bigger you become, the more enemies you attract? And in that video, you also mentioned it's almost part of the journey. Is it inevitable to have enemies? Yeah, it is. It's so funny you say that. Last night, we were having, um, we were having sushi with myself, Adam, Mario, and Kai, and we were talking about enemies. And I said, the challenge about enemies is the following. There are certain enemies that you can only avoid by not being relevant and not competing in a marketplace. So if you don't want to have any enemies, just don't do anything. You know, just play small and, and just live a regular average and ordinary life. But if you do that, your biggest enemy becomes the man in the mirror or the woman in the mirror because your spirit is furious with you for you not wanting to give your best. So there's nobody worse that's going to be your enemy than yourself. Now, let's talk about the second kind of enemies. You decide to go into real estate. You decide to be a podcaster. You decide to go and do insurance, investment, stocks, bonds, digital media. You decide to go into pharmaceutical sales. You decide to do, you know, engineer coding. And you want to be the best at it. One of the best at it. You go in. You're going to piss people off because you're going to take market share away, attention away, eyeballs away. They're going to bring up your name. Some of the old timers are going to hear about your name. They hate being compared to you. They hate saying, well, you know, how about this new guy? Oh, you know, they hate it, right? They can't stand it because you're taking that away. You can't avoid that. That part you cannot avoid. Now, then there's the third kind. The third kind are the kind of enemies that should be avoided, but you, due to self-inflicted comments or things you did, you created those enemies. Now, if they're intentional, more power to you. For example, let's just say if Meghan Merkel goes out there and says what she says, and she intentionally wants the royal family to be her number one enemy because she wants to get 100 million plus views so she can get that $110 million contract with Netflix to set up her next career. Now she's living in Montecito next to Oprah Winfrey and everybody else. Well, you knew what you were doing and it was intentional. But if you're not doing it intentionally, you just made a mistake and gave birth to seven new enemies that you could have avoided. You know, you have to be careful of creating those enemies. And I will tell you this, the most dangerous types of people you'll ever face. Most people think, you know, oh my gosh, I have to worry about that guy that's working so hard. I have to worry about that guy. I have to worry about that visionary. You don't have to worry about those guys at all. The people you have to worry about as competitors and enemies are extremely ambitious, lazy people. Those who are extremely ambitious, they think big, okay? They think very highly of themselves. Like you even see them walking around like a little bit pompous, arrogant. They're like, why do you look at me like you think you're better than me? You haven't done anything crazy with your life. But in their mind, they're better than everybody else. They're ambitious, right? But deep down inside, they don't want to put in the work. They think big. They, they're visionaries, they have big ideas, <laughs> they, they're talented, they just don't want to work hard. If there's any kind of enemies you don't want to give birth to are the lazy, ambitious people. Those guys will haunt you for the rest of your life. They're very weird people on how they are. Everybody else, you can't avoid some of the people you compete. It's going to be normal. I think from what I got from what you're saying is that they can actually drive you to do better and enemies in fact form part of your journey to your success can you comment on resilience i'm, I'm wondering because we're in this touchy-feely society where it's getting so much softer it links to resilience for me 
when people come across enemies, they trip out. And certainly in Australia, we make so many laws where we just don't allow any anyone to face anything that's of a difficult nature. Are we becoming less resilient as a society? There's no question about it. There's no question about it. I posted something on Facebook the other day about debate. And I said, one of the greatest things in life is debate. You know, I'd, I'd much rather watch a two hour debate of the Hitchens brothers debating God, the existence of, of God. It's three hours on YouTube, the two brothers, one's a Christian, one's a Catholic, believes in God. The other was an atheist, doesn't believe in God. You watch that three hour debate, you're going to learn more from that three hour debate than you would go into a college taking a semester in theology because debate is what we need. And by the time you're done watching that debate, you're going to walk away and you're going to say, you know what, I don't agree with what Hitchens said as an atheist. And, and I, I'm an atheist, but I don't, I don't think that argument was that strong because his brother said this, but you know, his brother said something about God, the existence of God and Virgin Mary and Jesus. I kind of like what Chris Hitchens said to that, but you know what, I'm walking away saying, I used to not believe there's a God. I think there is a God. I think there's more of a God today than I thought yesterday. Or you're going to walk away, you're going to say, you know, I used to believe in God. I, I don't know if I believe in it as much as I do. Great, because we had debate, right? Here's what debate does. The beautiful power of debate is the following. Put a Democrat and a Republican, let them debate. Put a Christian and atheist. Put a, a person that believes in pro-life, pro-choice. Guns, no guns. Military, no military. War to protect the country, no war. World peace. Somebody that believes in Apple, somebody that believes in Droid, somebody that loves soccer, somebody that loves football. Put them in a room, let them debate, let us watch it. You know what it does to the audience? It's the craziest thing. So all the extremes who are far right or far left, what a great debate does, it brings us inner. It doesn't bring us all the way in. It doesn't even get us to tip to the other side, but it just gets our extremes to be a little bit smaller and smaller. And the further we get to the center, the more we get to the center, the more reasonable we are. And the more reasonable we are, the easier it is for us to communicate with each other and deal with each other and understand each other's differences. But what looks like that's happening right now with all the sensitivity and the Pierce Morgan and all this other stuff, we're eliminating debate and it's going to make the next generation dumber, unfortunately. I think you've put that really well because... Debate, as you said, it, it actually brings us together. And if it doesn't bring us all the way together, it at least gives us empathy where we can understand what the other side is saying and perhaps why they're even thinking it. I get a lot out of Peter Schiff. So I'm very big into Bitcoin. My channel's primarily focused on money, economics, and crypto. And why I enjoy watching Peter Schiff is because I don't agree with what he says, but he has the courage and professionalism to come forth into the crypto community and say, I don't believe in it for these reasons. And he doesn't get offended when we talk about why we believe in it. And equally, we don't get offended why he does or doesn't believe in gold or what's going to be the future of money. But ultimately, I'm concerned that we're shutting down debate, which results in the shutting down of free speech and democracy, which actually links into what I'd like to talk about now. Two of your big videos. I want to go to a bit of a strategic level, if I may. So one video that you released just this week, I, I had been preparing for this interview for, for weeks, but then I watched one of your videos and I'm like, I have to include this. And that's called, Is New York the Next Detroit? Now, this is also going to link to your interview with Brigadier General Robert Spalding about China's silent takeover while America's mm -hmm. elite sleeps. Mm -hmm. uh, let me share a little story with you, if I may. So I studied in university in America for a while at Pepperdine. I believe Pepperdine was the university Great where... School. Very yeah, good one of school. your co-authors went there, I believe. Uh, oh yeah, Las Virginias. One of my co uh, uh, one of the authors, his daughter went there, and Tom Ellsworth used to teach at Pepperdine. It's a, a phenomenal university and a magical campus. I, I used to yes. dream about that place for a long time after I left. It's over the Pacific Ocean. But one of my classes, there, my most memorable classes of all my degrees everywhere in the world, was entrepreneurial studies. Now, my teacher, Richard Phillips, he said, where should we test a product? If we're going to test a new global product, where should we test it in the world? And everyone was putting their hands up with all these uh, recommendations. But in the end, I remember so clearly, he said, right here. This is where we test a new product, right here in LA. And then it goes from there. Now, I'm not talking about a product here. What I'm talking about is a societal view on how things are working. 
So what was very concerning to me over the last few years is watching people exit Los Angeles, California at large. And it rang back to what my professor was saying at Pepperdine was, this is where we test a product. Now that product in this instance is in fact, in my opinion, political opinion and political unrest. So we saw the mass exodus from California. Then we saw the mass exodus from New York. Then in your latest video, you spoke about the mass exodus from Detroit, where, you know, those stats that you read were just blowing my mind away. The amount of empty buildings, the, um, the I think it was a 50 minute call out time for police. And then at the end, yeah. And then at the end of the video, the most powerful thing that you said to me was don't let politics get into your family. Don't let the politics influence what your partner is thinking or saying is like, why aren't you doing this? Why aren't we doing that? Keep the politics out. My question to you, my friend is, is this bigger than just what's happening in America? Is this the erosion of the West? And is it being done perhaps through ideological subversion as Yuri Bezmenov speaks about in his work? Oh man, it's 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 a it's a scary thought because because the following reason you know when a kid comes from money he doesn't understand if the father didn't raise him right he doesn't understand how hard it is to make money. I had a guy I interviewed with. He was a, a psychologist and a planner for families who were billionaires. One of the families was uh, the Templeton family. The family is worth six billion dollars, and. 16 of the grandkids, I think out of the 16, 15 of them became drug addicts and ruined their lives. And I think one of them that was left, he was working with. And he said, I said, how can you save those kids? He says, it's too late. He says, Pat, the way to save those kids is very, very early. I said, what do you mean? He said, the biggest challenge with these kids is they got everything they wanted. They got the car, they got the house, they got the toys, they party, they were on other rich people. They hooked up with other rich people's daughters and they went over this and they, they, everything came easy to them, right? And then later on, you're trying to teach them character and you realize they never learned it. There's a book I read many years ago called Ultimate Gift written by a guy named Jim uh, Stovall. It's, it's a story about a guy named uh, Ray Stevens. And he's a guy that goes and works on an oil field. Eventually, the owner of that field dies. He, he strikes oil. He becomes a billionaire. And then when he becomes a billionaire, he shoots a video that will only be played when he dies. So one day he dies and he is attorney that was his best friend for 40 years. He invites him over to the house and he says, Red Stevens, not Roy, Red Stevens wants to talk to you. And he puts in the VHS tape and Red says, if you're here right now, he's going like this. If you're here right now, it's because I'm dead. Okay. And you're wondering what I'm going to do with the $2.2 billion and who it's going to go to. So let me break it to you. He says, unfortunately, I've spoiled all of you. His wife is there. His daughter's there. Everybody's there. So he says to my son, I'm going to give you all my properties with one exception. The janitor has more say on the properties than you. And you can never sell the properties, but you own them. I'm going to give my investment portfolio to my daughter. But guess what? The investment banker says what you do with the money, not you. I'm going to give my company to it. So he goes through all this stuff and he gives away. And at the end, his nephews left. And he says, for you, I have the ultimate gift. And the ultimate gift, I don't have a car. I don't have a house. I don't have a company to give you. The ultimate gift starts on Monday, Tuesday, when you come here. I have 12 videos for you to watch. Each week, you're going to get a challenge on Tuesday. If you take it, by the 12th month, I'm going to give you the ultimate gift. He says, the reason why, before you walk out, because you're upset that I don't have any money to give you, is because you're the only one that I didn't overspoil right? What a ridiculous story. Anyways, the nephew is struggling with it. I don't know if I'm going to do it or not. He comes, I'm not going to spoil the whole story for you. But the point is, America is Red Stevens. And America has spoiled everybody. Yes, let's give unemployment for this long. Yes, let's give, hey, FDR came out with Social Security. He only came out with Social Security for a few thousand people. He didn't come up with Social Security for everybody. And when he came up with Social Security, the average life expectancy in America was like mid-60s. And he started Social Security at 62, which means he only got Social Security for three years. That means it's as if today the life expectancy in America is 80. If FDR was alive today, Social Security would have started at 77. But no, today it's like, hey, more because we have money. More because we have money. More because America is so wealthy. Let's just keep throwing 
free money out, another stimulus, 1.9 trillion, another 900 billion, another 1.9 trillion to the point where in the last 13, 12 months, America in the last 12 months has printed 40% of all the currency America's ever had. Let me say that one more time. 40% of all the currency America's ever had was printed in the last 12 months, which guess who it favors? Those, who, those of you that believe in Bitcoin, that's a perfect argument for you. Also gold, but it's a perfect argument for you. This is why the dollar is getting a black eye right now, the more we print. So for me, I am very much concerned when I see an AOC and you go out there, an AOC, great market, a great at telling her stories. And just a year ago, this girl had a couple million followers on Twitter. And today she has 12.6 million followers on Twitter and she's young. She's a representative of Bronx and Queens and she has so much say. What does this mean? We didn't have this kind of momentum with socialism 40 years ago. Communism and socialism, the ideas have been around for a long time since Karl Marx when he wrote the book. And, you know, Marxism, communism, socialism, those ideas have been around for a while. But today, due to social media, people are looking at somebody and saying, wow, 12.6 million followers. She must really know what she's talking about. Maybe the socialism thing's not really not bad. So then that leads me to my concern of, okay, if you live in California, you're not happy where you're at, you go to Texas. If you live in Detroit, they mistreat you, you go to Texas. If you're in New York, they mistreat you, you go to Florida. If you're in Illinois, they mistreat you, you go to Tennessee. So, you know, California, you can go to Nevada because there's no state taxes. The point is, if I don't like a state, I can go to a different place. I have the options. But what if it gets to a point that eventually the federal government that mistreats you? Where do you go to next? That's right. Do you go to Costa Rica? Mm. Do you go to Dubai? Do you go to Singapore? Do you go to New Zealand? Where do you go? Do you go to Canada? Where do you go? Mm. Where do you go? So, you know, I would be more comfortable if I knew that, uh, like, if today, uh, I always say this, if somebody were to give me 10 million people and a good amount of land, a country we would recruit the most incredible minds and make it very difficult to get into that country because you would only be able to get into that country that you bring value to the table. And we don't care if people don't like it, but within two decades, we would be the place everybody would want to live in because we would build it right off the bat with certain values and principles to protect. Unfortunately, today, that option number two is not very obvious. There are option number two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. But it's not as obvious. So America has the ability to bully its own citizens because what are you going to do? I dare you to leave America. Where are you going to go? And they're right today. So if, if a handful of countries took advantage of that, it's like working at Google. Google mistreats you. Go to Facebook. But imagine if there's only one Google. Where are you going to go if Google mistreats you? You don't have a choice. They're paying you pretty well. You ain't going to go anywhere else. So America's bullying right now. And uh, I don't know how long it's going to last. I'm always pro creator, pro builder. Uh, a builder is always going to be wanted in a country. A creator is always going to be wanted in a country. They, they're never, they're never ever single. Everybody always wants to be with a builder and a creator, but one country or two need to really level up their game today because there's a lot of talent that could potentially go to them. This is where your work comes into it, I think. So we were speaking about debate before. So certainly at university, debate seems to be shut down so much like you can only have one opinion and if you go against the, the mainstream opinion you're a bigot you're a racist you're a xenophobe and it actually stops debate and it stops this uh, ability to to think outside the box and that, that's why we have this kind of push towards socialism perhaps now wh when you spoke about the money printing press where we become reliant on the daddy state the daddy state that will give us lots of money and, and we don't need to work and we don't need to worry about anything because the printing press will just give us more money. I recently released a video called Printing Press Goes Burr, Bitcoin Goes Boom. And what I'm talking about in that video is the more money that the printing press pumps out, the more people are forced into a harder money such as Bitcoin. Whether they like Bitcoin or not, it's in two ways. What I'm finding now is people are shifting into Bitcoin, not because they think they can buy a Lamborghini, but because there's no other choice. It is now at a point that if you keep your money in cash, it's becoming it's becoming a liability. It's financially irresponsible to not at least have some Bitcoin as people are fleeing out of the US dollar and trying to run to a new money, which is Bitcoin. What are your thoughts on the future of money? If America keeps printing it and America keeps pushing everyone into a corner to go a certain way and people do flee the states uh, at a national level and then at a federal level going somewhere else, when will it stop 
do you think there could be a war on the horizon? Oh, I mean, of course. I mean, look, look, look at one of the things right now with Bitcoin. They're trying to find out how to regulate Bitcoin. Janet Yellen is trying to do whatever she can to get a hold of Bitcoin. For five years, if you see anybody asking me about Bitcoin, watch what's been my biggest concern every single time. They're going to try to regulate it. They're going to try to regulate it. They're going to try to regulate it. That's the biggest thing because that's what the government likes to do. They like to regulate gold. They like to regulate Bitcoin. They like to regulate anything and everything they can get their hands on to administrate. So um, I don't know. I think I can tell you one thing for a fact is today, if there's ever been an era where all the Bitcoin people are laughing, saying, I told you so, today's the day. Like all the Bitcoin, pro-Bitcoin people ought to go on Twitter and say, I told you so, hashtag Bitcoin. They, they have the right to do so because they can say that today. Now, Remember how earlier I talked to you about the most dangerous people you'll ever face are lazy, ambitious people? Yeah. Regulators and politicians are exactly that. They're the lazy, ambitious people. They hate the fact that you came up with an idea that you don't need somebody to take care of you. They hate the fact that you don't need uh, a guy in your pocket to finance your election or whatever your campaign. They hate the fact that they're not willing to work seven to 10 o'clock at night to build a business and go sell it for $100 million five years later or 10 years later for a billion dollars. They hate that because they're not going to do that. That's not what they're going to do. So what do they do? Do they go behind closed doors and say, I'm going to go get power. You want all the freedom? I'm going to be able to push you around because I'll have the power. I make the laws. I'm the lawmaker and I can make laws to make your life a living hell. That's how they do it. So Bitcoin's biggest enemy is going to be the lawmakers, the politicians, governments that are going to want to get into it. The benefit, I hope Elon Musk supports you guys and stays that way. It doesn't go back and forth. doesn't kind of like, because you guys need a very strong supporter on your end to prevent these other guys from getting away. The good news right now is JP Morgan Chase just officially put 35 or 34 job postings online for people that are experts in blockchain. And you know, quite frankly, Morgan Stanley only put two and Goldman Sachs only put two, but JP Morgan Chase put 34, 35. Everybody's like, what, wait, what? JP Morgan is hiring 34 blockchain experts? Yes, why? Well, they're coming out with their own Bitcoin. So the more these stories happen and you have the allies, when it gets to a point where they're facing off the enemies, that's where you benefit. But then you have to also be thinking about if they come out with their own crypto, say JP Morgan Chase comes out with their own crypto, do you think behind closed doors, they would support some of the politicians to hurt the Bitcoin brand because they're not Bitcoin, they're a different crypto? I don't know. All I'm saying to you is you have to pay very, very close attention to the lawmakers and the lazy, ambitious people, because they're the ones that are probably going to try to make your life a living kill. So with what Robert Spalding was saying about China being perhaps the greatest threat to the US at the moment, in his book and in his interview, I found that very confronting what he was talking about. So in my opinion, I think we've got this perfect storm. We have the opinions of ex-generals, such as Spalding, saying China is a threat. We have the collapse of the petrodollar and the US dollar as people are fleeing out. We have civil unrest within the United States and Western nations at large, where we shut down debate and move more to one side and even promote socialism. What is the tipping point? Will there be a war? Sad about will there be a war? There is war right now. We are in war. It's just a different kind of war. Like, for example, you ever been to a family gathering where there's a lot of politics involved, but if you didn't know about it, you would never know there's war yeah. going on. I don't know if you know what I'm talking about. Like, yeah, let's just yeah. say you go into a, a family gathering. Yeah, when like, you bring your partner, they think everything's good on the surface, but you know what's going on in the background. Well, I'm even talking yeah. dirtier than that. I'm talking about you go to a family gathering and you know your mom and your dad's sister hate each other. Like you've seen the fights, nobody else has seen it. They just called each other, you know, the worst word just a week ago, but at a family gathering like, hey, how are you? So how's your kids? By the way, I just want you to know, my son just graduated from USC. Oh, congratulations to your son. What she's trying to say is, hey, you idiot. My son is better than your son. I'm a better parent than you. And the uh, uh, auntie responds and says, oh, guess what, what? Our son just bought his own first house. We're so proud of him that he's so independent that he doesn't lean on his mommy and daddy for everything. We like that. We have so much respect for our son. And you're just kind of standing there. You're saying mom and auntie are going at it, right? There's a lot of war going on. But if you don't know the inner 
detail stories of what's going on, you wouldn't know about it. Okay, so where am I going with this? So right now, we have so many proxy wars, it's not even funny. It's proxy war galore today is what we have. Uh, we have so many cyber wars right now, it's not funny. Not even funny. Uh, China to Microsoft, Russia threatening Twitter, that's cyber. They're going and they're attacking them that way. Very easy. We have bio-warfare wars that could happen at any given time. The wars of today are not going to be the kind of wars that we had in World War II or World War I. It's going to be the kind of war that you can't figure out who attacked you. You know, you know how you fight a person and you're standing up and you're like, hey, you want to go? And he punches you in the face. You know who hits you. This is the kind of fight where you get hit in the back of the head and you don't know who hit you. You get stabbed. You don't know who stabbed you. You're all of a sudden sick. You don't know how you got sick. It's a very dirty war today because nobody can, the, the fingerprints aren't anywhere. Like imagine somebody robs your house. You call the cops. They come. What do they do? Well, let me see this here. Boom, 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 boom. Fingerprints, put it in there. Boom. Okay. It's a guy named John Doe who lives on 42nd and Broadway. Let's go to his house right now. They pull up. Oh, he's running from the back. Get him. Hey. Finger, this is your shoes. Yes, you're robbed. You're going to jail. You have all the laptops you stole. No, I sold it to the pawn shop. Well, then you're doing jail time for one year. There's no fingerprints today. No fingerprints today. So it, it's, a, it's a very, very weird time. Today, it's like Trump was a president, right? And he would have been a phenomenal president in the 50s, the 60s, because he wouldn't have a way to constantly share his thoughts on Twitter 24 seven, but he would have still been a strong president on TV. But today he created way too many new enemies we didn't need. He kept giving birth to new enemies. I don't know if that makes sense or not. He was constantly pissing off old enemies and waking them up. I get that. Like, it's, it's very much we admire. Look at him. He's not afraid of anybody. It's great. But it's like, I totally get it. I understand. I admire, too. I love the fact that somebody says, no, I'm not. I'm standing up. Yes, stand up. But, but don't give birth to new enemies. Somebody today has to be a diplomat, you know, that turns enemies into allies, into friends. Somebody has to be a synergist today that just kind of calms the nerves. And it's not Biden. Okay, It's not a Biden. It's not an Obama. It's not a Trump. It's, it's not, it's got to be a different kind of a personality, but, uh, you know, it's, it's a very, very random, weird time today. Somebody has to be the combination of strength, poise, yet at the same time, their ambitions is to unite and create a environment where there's confidence and diplomacy versus their ambition being, I have to be the most powerful man in the world. That this is, this, that's a wrong kind of a time to be a leader. Anyways, I mean, probably I'm, I'm not even making any sense to the viewer. And I don't even know if I'm making sense to you right now. But all I'm trying to say today is it's a lot of wars going on that we cannot see publicly. You can't spot the fingerprints. And it's a time that gives birth to a lot of extreme personalities. And unfortunately, that's the last thing we need today. It's the last thing we need today. It makes perfect sense to me. Unfortunately, it makes too much sense. And it's, uh, it's quite scary, especially as you're saying that in the olden days, you could, you could see your adversary. Uh, the good analogy is, of course, is that fight. In Australia, we have a term called sucker punch or coward punch, where someone comes up behind you and punches you in the back of the head. You hit the ground, you don't even know what's happened. And I think that is happening on the global stage. In one of your videos, the industry is facing massive disruption. You spoke about 10 things that were restaurant, movie theaters, telecommunications, cars, wallets, retailers, insurance, traditional journalism, college sports, gas stations. But then you put in an 11th one, Pat, and that was really, really powerful. What you said was given social media and where we are at the moment and the social commentary and the followership from people who may not know better, there is a likelihood that we could in fact see a 35-year-old president of the United States. And when I heard that, it just blew my mind because I'm like, this guy's dead right. It's dead right because we've shut down debate in university. We now just live on Twitter and social media. People don't know what's really happening in the background. Mainstream has said, go for this person. So we just do. And before you know it, you've got someone who does know how to use social media. They are young 
and influenced by whatever's been happening at university, they have been shut down from debate. And before we know it, we don't have the leader that you just described before that the world needs. I thought that was powerful. Pat, I know you've got a lot on. So if you don't mind, I'd like to close off with 15 rapid questions. Sure. You're familiar with how this works. I seek a one word answer. Less than five is okay, but one is preferable. You can pass on any and revisit if you like. Rapid round. Bitcoin. Not going away. Gold. Get some. The US dollar. Scary. College degrees. Unnecessary. The current global pandemic. Could have been prevented. Trump. Necessary bad timing. Biden. Not the president. Democracy. In danger. A World War Three. Very different. True or false. True leaders are born, not created. Uh, False. Number 11, compulsory national service in peacetime. Pass. The future of YouTube. Not going away anytime soon. Your most memorable interview? Sammy to Bull Gravano. An early retirement. Never. And number 15, this interview. Fantastic. <laughs> All right. I'm that actually being honest. Fantastic. Thank you. And by the way, when I said uh, Biden, not the president, what I mean by that is it's the influential people behind closed doors that are running America today, not him. I didn't mean this. Said mine has nothing to do with whether it was a fair election or not, I've already shared my position on that. It's yeah. about the fact that he's not the real decision maker. Others are making it for him. I think at a minimum, we just don't see him in front of the camera. You had Trump as one extreme that he was constantly tweeting 24 seven, but with Biden, it's just like, where's the president of the free world? Where, yeah. Where's the leader? I, I don't yeah. see him. Yeah. But look, uh, Pat, as I said, I'm immensely grateful, not only for your time with me today, you proved that you give knowledge as well as giving to the people who want to learn more from you in, a, in an interview such as this. Before we do close off, how can we learn more about you? How can we get more from Valuetainment and from Pat? I think if you want to order the book, you can go to Amazon or Barnes & Noble or Apple to get the Audible. They can get your next five months. This will kind of give you an idea how I think. And then if you want to you know, see the content, it's on YouTube. And if you want to message me, uh, message me on Twitter at Patrick Bay David, I do respond. I must admit, I was impressed with one of your videos when you actually did a job call out for people during a YouTube video that you made. I'm like, I've never seen that before. And you actually gave your phone number. I thought that was brilliant. Um, and I'm, I'm sure you attracted a lot of the talent from doing yes. so. All right, Patrick, thank you so much. For those of you who haven't met me, my name's Adam Stokes, links below. Also, I will leave links to Valuetainment and everything. Pat, Pat, thank you so much for joining us. Fantastic interview. Thank you.